All right, so last time we introduced the idea of uh, uncertainty and error uh, in experimentation, and uh, we're going to start on a journey of trying to figure out how to quantify that uh, with this lecture here today. And the aim today is, in this lecture, is just to figure out a way to describe random variation. How do we think about um, using math to describe something that we don't know what's going to happen that is uh, that's random. So before we get there, we we're going to divide error and uncertainty into two different classes. Uh, and one of those that we're going to deal with uh, initially is called random error. Uh, and so random error has to do with a variation within our measurements. And those variations can come from the fact that the thing we're measuring is actually changing. Uh, or they can come from the fact that we're measuring something in a slightly different way uh, and get slightly different answers every time. Just to give you an example of how that might work, uh, imagine you're trying to uh, figure out what the diameter of a sphere is and you're using a caliper to do that. Um, you might uh, measure, use that caliper and measure the diameter in one direction um, and get, say, you know, 1.11 centimeters uh, and then in a different direction maybe you get 1.16 centimeters uh, and maybe you're a little bit off center and so you get 1.14 centimeters the second time you measure in that direction uh, so even something that's very solid and unchanging is going to give us different uh, readings over time and that, uh, those, that difference is uh, random error and is sometimes called scatter. And so you can see that uh, here, this is a nice image uh, of scatter. If I'm, This is the true mean value of something I'm measuring. Uh, I might have measurements that are sort of scattered around that bullseye. Um, we sometimes call that precision too. If I have a very precise measurement, uh, then that scatter is going to be very small. Okay, So that's random variation. Now, there's another kind of error uh, called systematic error. We're not going to dig into that in a lot of detail today, uh, but it's important to recognize the difference. Uh, systematic error is not about random variation, but it's about something to do with your experimental setup, how you're taking readings, uh, maybe something, uh, some extraneous variable that you're uh, ignoring that gives you the wrong answer, that gives you error uh, in the same direction every time. Okay, uh, sometimes we call that bias, uh, which means that our all of our readings are biased in one direction. They're they're giving us, you know, uh, a wrong answer in the same way. A good example of that is like if you're trying to measure, say, the velocity of a cart moving. Um, and the forces that create that, and you've got some friction, you ignore that friction, you're going to get the wrong answer. That cart's going to go slower than you think every time uh, because you're ignoring the possibility of friction there. That would be a systematic error, something that's part of that experiment that's leading to the same kind of wrong answer all the time. So we call that uh, bias, but also accuracy. So accuracy and precision, scientists actually still use those terms quite a bit, even though I think they're, they're a little confusing. Precision means, am I actually getting the, um, the value that, is, that I'm measuring? Uh, accuracy is, am I actually getting the quantity that is the true mean value? Um, so looking up here, this is a precise measurement that is not very accurate. In other words, it has systematic error, but it does not have very much random error. This is an accurate measurement. Our mean value would be about right here, but it is not very precise. And so here we have a lot of random uncertainty or random error, but not much systematic error. Same thing down here. We can see that in these values, this dotted line, the dots are my data points, the dotted line, is the mean value of my data points. We can see some scatter in our data, and that is random error, but then we can see that my mean is actually not the same as my true value, and that is my systematic error. 
So if you uh, can think about taking another measurement and you think, I expect to get the same kind of answer, but it's wrong, it's off what the true value is, that's a systematic error. If you expect an answer that's maybe a little unpredictable, but it's on either side of what that true value is, again, we don't really know what that true value is oftentimes, um, then that would be random error. Okay, so those terms are ones that we want to be uh, comfortable with. Scatter, bias, precision, accuracy, random, and systematic. All right, but let's talk about random error because we want to first start to be able to quantify uh, random uncertainty. Um, and to do that, we have to start describing that randomness, describe things that happen in a random way in the world. And so let's imagine we're taking uh, measurements of a velocity, uh, air velocity within an air duct, within an air duct. And that's going to give us some natural scatter, right? Um, and so maybe I take a bunch of uh, data points, and those are those black points down here, and I get some readings that say 0.65 meters per second, some that say 1.35, but most of them are uh, around 1.0. And that's pretty typical, right? We would expect that uh, our uh, data points are going to be kind of centered around a point and then more data points are going to be close to that center than are far away from it. And we actually have a name for that and that's called a central tendency. We expect data to behave with a central tendency. We're going to make that assumption as we start to describe random variation. So that's our first assumption that our data has a central tendency to it. Not always true uh, and we might have to you know, step back in certain situations, but most of the time that's going to be true. Now, we can see that central tendency really well if we create what's called a histogram. Uh, and that is what you see over here. Uh, sometimes this is called a bin plot. Uh, and you can imagine why, because what this is saying is, how many data points do I have between 0.95 and 1.05? Well, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven, I've got seven occurrences between these two points. So I put those seven data points in this bin, uh, and I only have, you know, one data point between 0.65 and 0.75. And so there's only one in that bin. And this histogram, you can start to see, oh, does my data have this central tendency? Um, now notice that we can extend that. This y-axis here is just telling us how many occurrences that's modestly useful, but not useful uh, as we try to generalize, but we can turn that into a percent frequency, and that makes it a lot more useful to say that 35% of my data points are in this bin, uh, while only 5% are in uh, my bin over here. Okay. Now, what happens if we keep taking more data points? Well, hopefully we start to see something like this. Right? If we take an infinite number of data points, we start to smooth out that curve, and hopefully it's a nice symmetrical curve with a central tendency, uh, and we call that a probability density function. Uh, and so this is, if we imagine making these bins smaller and smaller and smaller, like instead of 0.1, uh, make a bin that goes from 0.95 to 0.96 and another one from 0.96 to 0.97, etc., uh, that our histogram would start to turn into this PDF uh, with enough data points. That's the kind of assumption that we're making as we describe random data. We're going to imagine what happens if I just kept taking data points. Now again, we've said, oh, it would turn symmetric. Would it? Maybe. Uh, most of the time, yes. Uh, and again, that's our second assumption. One was central tendency. Two is that we're going to have a symmetric uh, data set, that it's going to be uh, the same on either side of our um, mean value. So, like I said, we don't really know what its shape is, um, but we're going to make a third assumption. Not only is it centrally, has a central tendency, and is symmetric, we're going to assume that it fits a particular shape, which is a big jump. Um, why are we going to assume that? Because a lot of scientists have taken a lot of data and found out that it works pretty well, right? It's a, it's a descriptor um, 
it's not actually something that is in the data set that you have. It's experience as scientists and engineers that says a Gaussian curve, or what's sometimes called a normal curve or a bell curve, is a pretty good description of random variation. And that Gaussian curve is just a mathematical function. This function, y equals e to the negative x squared, looks like this, centered around zero, okay, uh, and sloping off symmetrically on either side. So you can see, oh, central tendency, oh, symmetrical. <laughs> Look, it kind of fits that shape there, right? So we make this assumption, and the reason we do that is so that we can use math to describe that random variation and guess where, say, a next data point might come from. Now, the last thing here is that that curve, y equals negative e to the x squared, doesn't offer a lot of variation. So we're going to do what's called parameterizing that curve. Um, we're going to include these two parameters, x bar and sigma, and change this equation. So what have we done here? Well, you can see this is still essentially y equals e to the negative x. That x bar there uh, is going to shift this curve right and left, and that sigma is going to change its shape. So if we look over here, if my sigma is 2, my peak is at, of my probability density function, is at about 0.2. If my sigma is 0.5, my peak is at about 0.8. Um, same with that x bar. My x bar is going to give me the center of my curve here at 5, down here at 2. So when we parameterize a curve, what we're doing is we're adding some parameters. We're adding some uh, values that can help us understand what that curve looks like. So this looks mathematically uh, ugly, uh, but it makes it actually a lot easier to understand what's going on there. So um, this guy here is just a number, right? Because this is a parameter, a constant. Uh, this is a constant. So we're multiplying by this. Why are we doing that? Well, essentially, we want to make sure that when we integrate this curve from negative infinity to infinity, that our integral is equal to 1. And that's what this guy does. It just divides it out to make it equal to 1. Why do we want it to be equal to 1? Uh, because this plot represents where all of my data points fall. Right? And my probability density function says that the probability is around 0.2 here. Um, all of my data points are, rep think about this as that histogram, right? All of my data points are in a bin here. So when I sum up all of those bins, I should get 100% of my data points. That's what that one is, okay? So this, again, you know, it looks kind of nasty. Uh, but it makes life easier because it allows us to describe this, the width of the curve and where that curve is centered. And what we'll do next time is use those parameters to start to describe uh, uh, the variation uh, within data sets.